Brought to you by the Physicians Committee. Hello, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. Thanks so very much for raising your health IQ with us right here on Facebook and on YouTube. It is now October, and that means it is the Let's Beat Breast Cancer Campaign 2021 edition. And so we are going to devote this episode of The Exam Room Live exclusively to breast cancer. And the woman who is here with us today, to answer all of your questions that are in the doctor's mailbag is someone who is a best-selling author, a world-renowned breast cancer surgeon, and certainly a friend to us here at the Physicians Committee, Dr. Christy Funk. Thank you so very much for being here. Oh, thanks for having me. I love the exam room podcast, Chuck. I love you. And we love you just as much. And I would love it if you, who is watching this right now, uh, if you have a question, go ahead and leave it in the comments or the chat. And we will do our best to get an answer to as many of these questions as we possibly can. Now, Dr. Funk, let's start with the question today from Pam. And Pam's question is a good one. And I was talking to my wife about this the other day because there are people, I won't name her name, who really love them some soda. And so Pam's question is right on point. She wants to know, does drinking soda increase the risk of cancer? Ooh, Pam, it could. In the sum totality that soda is a poor, uh, highly caloric, simple sugar drink that immediately lets that glucose get absorbed through the small intestine into the bloodstream, spiking the glucose content, therefore, bringing out the main trumpet that says, hey, there's glucose here, that's called insulin, and states of high glucose and high insulin in a chronic setting certainly elevate inflammation and ele inflammation elevated over chronic periods of time is cancer's playground. So there aren't direct causing uh, cause and consequence there with the soda straight to your breast causing breast cancer, but it's all part of that environment that gets created that stokes cancer for sure. Oh, okay. Here we go. People love best foods. And this is something that we will be covering extensively throughout the month. Matter of fact, coming up, we've got the top 12 breast superfoods. And then I believe we're looking at the top 10, 18 most anti-estrogenic foods. So we have a lot of foods that we're going to cover throughout the month. But let's start here with this question from Lisa. Lisa is wondering which fruits are most effective for fighting breast cancer. Berries, 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 for sure. So they really, the they pack a punch to uh, breast cancer. They're packed with fiber, which helps you bind excess estrogen and poop it out. And um, amongst the berries, there is a secret one that I believe it's in episode three will be revealing that you don't want to miss. But of all the fruits, berries, a standalone other fruit in studies that has been associated with one a day drops breast cancer by 24% is the apple, especially red. So apples and berries, but really all fruits. They are just all packed with chemicals that decrease estrogen, decrease inflammation, and even angiogenesis, the creation of blood flow to the tumors. I think a lot of people are probably wondering well, how much of an impact does eating an organic fruit have? Like what is the, the cumulative benefit there versus getting a conventional berry? I would say that the studies show that the parts per million of pesticides that get into your body from eating inorganic, non-organic fruits is not sufficient enough to cause cell injury and mutation. However, it's also not antioxidant food. <laughs> so, um, you know, the uh, whatever amount of pesticide you're putting in your body, it doesn't have a anti-cancer effect. So it may kill the pesticides, but in uh, big doses, it certainly would kill you. In the tiny doses from eating non-organic, I would way rather you choose a inorganic berry than an organic burger or an, even an organic cookie, vegan cookie, right? So, <laughs> It's always a compared to what question, and I definitely would rather have you eat the berry in comparison to anything except the organic berry would probably have a slight edge over the non-organic berry. All right. So you can't talk about fruits without talking about vegetables. And that brings us to Amy's question, which vegetables are best for fighting breast cancer? 
cruciferous vegetables and chief among them is broccoli and the crown on broccoli goes to broccoli sprouts. Why? They have the hundred times the content of sulforaphane than broccoli does, but broccoli is still king. So uh, certainly the cruciferous vegetables. Next up, allium vegetables. Those are your garlic, onions, shallots. These allium vegetables contain um, aromatase inhibiting properties, which is an enzyme that creates estrogen. And there's one study that I love because it's just so revealing. Uh, it's a French study, 11 to 12 servings of allium vegetables weekly drop breast cancer by 75%. So those are two biggies. There we go. Hello, everybody. Uh, good to see you again. Um, so I want to skip ahead to a question from Linda. And Linda's question is, what should we eat along with those fruits and vegetables to really help with the absorption of those beneficial nutrients? Is there Are there any foods that really, like, really would help your body soak in what it needs? Yeah, so a lot of the healthy vitamins and minerals and a lot of the antioxidants, such as the lycopene and tomatoes, are fat soluble. So you want to have some healthy fats alongside your vegetables to enhance the absorption. So examples would be avocados, nuts, seeds, nut and seed butters, um, and olives. So for those who like and probably should shy away from oils, but if you cooked, if you sauteed something, you could put a splash of olive oil in there, that would be a fat. Flaxseed is far and away that most concentrated source of a healthy omega-3 fatty acids on the planet. So if what, if you're having, say, a plate full of roasted vegetables and a whole grain, you could just sprinkle a tablespoon of flaxseed and boom, there'd be your fat and your lignans, the other important nutrient in flax for fighting breast cancer. All right, let's take a question now from Sarah. And this is a popular one. Uh, she's wondering if you could explain the extent that genetics play in terms of a woman's breast cancer risk. And when she sent in this email, she also said, well, look, you know, there are three women in my family. My mother, my aunt, and my cousin all have breast cancer. And I hear you say that genetics don't play as big of a role as we might think, but I'm still scared because there is such a strong component there for my family. There is a strong component there. And when you get first degree relatives in the mix, it, the um, connection between a possible genetic susceptibility and cancer is definitely higher. I say that genetics doesn't have as big a role as people think because for the vast majority, it does not. Only five to 10% of all breast cancer comes from an inherited genetic mutation, such as BRCA, CHECK2, PALB2. However, in the strong family history trees, there could easily be a gene mutation for which science has not figured out how to test it and know that it exists. So you could have an unknown gene mutation. And or what else is inherited amongst families are uh, the rack of beef recipe or um, the mashed potatoes with extra butter, right? So sometimes just the dietary and lifestyle thing, like, oh, when we go on vacation, we sit by the pool all vacation and drink margaritas and eat cheesy nachos, right? So there can be habits and food choices that are also literally inherited as part of the family culture that unfortunately are carcinogenic habits and foods. So if you are, if your mom and your sister and your aunt have all tested negative for a gene mutation, or say your mom has, then you haven't inherited a gene mutation that we have a test for. There are statistical models. The one I use is called TigerQ-SICK. You can even go online and Google that and put in your own stats to see your 10 year and your lifetime risk of getting breast cancer. And if it exceeds 20%, you need extra imaging and attention paid to your breasts on an annual basis. And if it exceeds 30%, that's when we kind of start wading into the waters of more active risk reduction through medication or even surgery. So um, while it's true that the majority of people who have breast cancer or at risk for breast cancer are, are um, not genetically predisposed, that doesn't negate the fact that certain people are predisposed and you could be one of them. 
All right. You just mentioned margaritas in that answer. And that brings us to our next question, which is one from Maggie. And this is a I think that this is a a brilliant question. Um, She wants to know what effect might increased drinking during the pandemic have on cancer risk. And let me add to that is like based off of what you and I have talked about in the past and what I assume we're also going to be touching on later this month. um, Alcohol is very much a risk factor here. And so I'm wondering if you're expecting to see an uptick in patients um, as this pandemic drags on or hopefully winds down. Unfortunately, I am expecting to see more women with breast cancer. The um, National Cancer Institute estimates an additional 10,000 breast cancer deaths in the upcoming decade, breast and colorectal cancer combined. 10,000 additional deaths solely attributed to the effects of the pandemic. So, What the effects of the pandemic have been, in addition to in the very early stages, having women avoid their mammogram screening, thankfully, as of now, we've rebounded to pre-pandemic levels, all and except Latinx and Asian women. So sisters, if you're due or overdue, please schedule those appointments. Um, But also sort of the unspoken reality, which you're exactly hitting on, Maggie, is that our lifestyle, our behavioral changes during the pandemic have all unfortunately been the exact behaviors that we know elevate breast cancer risk. Among them, drinking alcohol. Others are being sedentary, choosing more um, highly caloric and um, comfort foods. So uh, uh, snacky foods like chips and cookies and crackers and cake. Um, Exercising less, being sedentary more and stressing out more. Specifically with your question, alcohol, the effect it has on increasing cancer risk is multifold. The main drivers are that it increases estrogen levels, all types of alcohol, whether you're talking hard liquor, beer, or wine. It impairs the immune system. Your immune system's entire job is to identify and destroy cancer cells. It creates a metabolite called acetaldehyde, which is highly carcinogenic, and it inactivates an enzyme in your body whose sole purpose is to take folate or folic acid and convert it into its active form methylfolate, which watches over DNA as it divides to make sure it preserves its true um, structure so that it's not mutated and cancerous. So you kind of come at cancer causation from four different ways every time you sip and swallow any type of alcohol. Man, that that's a heck of a thing right there. Um, good follow up here from Kiana wants to know, does wine increase breast cancer risk more so than beer or liquor? Oh, well, if you really want to get into the weeds with the alcohol literature and breast cancer, red wine and red wine only might have less of an effect than beer or spirits or white wine. It has two redemptive properties. It has resveratrol, which is a potent anti-proliferative, anti-carcinogenic agent. It's actually being studied as a cancer treatment in and of itself, resveratrol. resveratrol. And it has another function called aromatase inhibition. This is an enzyme aromatase that converts steroids into estrogen and estrogen fuels 80% of breast cancers. So when red wine knocks out that enzyme, you get less estrogen. All right. I think that there was no way we were going to be able to do this show without coming across this question. And this one comes to us from Lucy. And Lucy wants the definitive answer. Does soy increase or reduce the risk of breast cancer? (gasps) Lucy, I love this question. And I'm going to say it loudly and clearly. Soy reduces the risk of breast cancer, of getting it, of having it recur, and of dying from it. Soy in its fermented forms, tempeh, miso, natto, tamari, in its lightly minimally processed forms, tofu, soy milk, edamame, soybeans, soy it up, sisters. You will have a clear 25 to 60% drop in breast cancer, occurrence, recurrence, and death. Where did this whole notion of soy being so detrimental to our health come from? It came from mouse studies in the 70s and 80s where they would graft breast cancers onto mice and then feed them a bunch of soy and a solid percentage of the cancers grew. So we're like, ah, soy, isoflavones, genistein, diadzin. These are plant-based estrogens that fuel estrogen-driven cancers, which they do in some mice because of the way they metabolize isoflavones. So, you know, sometimes humans act like mice. Sometimes we don't. 
And when it came came down to the soy, soy story, we do not, we do not behave as mice. And therefore, isoflavones are metabolized totally differently. We didn't know for sure uh, until 2009. That's when the human studies on soy and breast cancer started to pour in. And not a single one, not a single one has shown a detrimental effect. It's all beneficial. Boy, yeah, take that one to heart. Uh, mark that down and, and definitely spread the word. It's amazing how much that that myth still stays out there, how pervasive it is. And, and you know, kind of it's it's head scratching that, you know, once something gets out there and it sticks in somebody's brain, how hard it can be to change their mind about certain things. But this is definitely uh, one worth banging the drum over. Um, here we go. Mary, this is a good question, I'm sure, is on the minds of a lot of women as well. Does hormone replacement therapy increase the risk for breast cancer? Mary, it does across the board. If you put a thousand women on hormone replacement therapy, seven will get a breast cancer they otherwise would not have gotten. Uh, another huge study, a meta-analysis from the UK very recently in late 2019 showed uh, in 100,000 women that if you put 50 women on hormone replacement therapy, one will get a breast cancer. So um, that's 200% more than the big US study from 2002. But by and large, extending the period of time to which your breast cells are subjected to elevated estrogen levels or just estrogen in general, um, increases the likelihood of a cancer forming and then being fed by that very same estrogen. So. There are non-estrogenic alternatives to some menopause symptoms you might be experiencing. So I encourage you to check things out like acupuncture, Asian herbs, menopause miracle is something Pink Lotus Elements offers and it's highly effective at controlling all, all the major symptoms of menopause. There's exercise, soy consumption, meditation, biofeedback. There are other prescriptions meds if you're really miserable and don't wanna be taking estrogens. But I encourage you to explore your options with your doctor because jumping straight from your first hot flash to hormone replacement therapy is a bad idea. We've talked a lot uh, throughout Let's Beat Breast Cancer, the, the number of years that we've been doing these shows together now about the, the role that weight can play in someone's risk of getting breast cancer. And here's kind of the anomaly, right, is uh, the keto diet, which is high in fat, but has been shown to promote weight loss, at least in the short term, among people. So this question from Julie is an interesting one. How does the keto diet, in your opinion, impact the odds of getting breast cancer? In my opinion, the keto diet is going to elevate the chances of getting breast cancer in the long run. And I don't know how long that run has to be before the elevation really kicks in. In the short term, effect of losing weight would be a beneficial um event in that it reduces your risk of breast cancer. But the way in which you lost that weight dramatically increased saturated fat intake. There's literally a receptor called CD36 that is a fat receptor and specifically palmitic acid, which specifically comes from junk food, meat, and dairy. That's it. Um, and that receptor is filled by this particular saturated fat, and that receptor is the one responsible for breast cancer metastasis. So increasing saturated fat is a very dangerous um, thing to be doing in, when it comes to, to breast cancer. So high saturated fat diets are associated with an elevation in breast cancer risk. Interestingly, low fat, it doesn't have that connection. And I think it might be because of this CD36 receptor. Um, the, the other things that are consumed in an effort to have a high fat, high protein, low carb diet include meat and especially red meat has xeranol in it for the, for the mass, vast majority of meat produced in, in America. Xeranol is the most synthetic um, the most potent synthetic estrogen that's ever been made. And it's shoved behind the ear of every conventionally raised cow to make it grow fat fast. And it absolutely gets in our bodies. There's a study out of New Jersey with like, I think it's 178, um, uh, 11 to 13 year old girls. And they analyzed their urine and 78% of them had xeranol in their urine and every one of them had meat the night before. So xeranol definitely gets in our bodies. And the, as I just said, it is the most potent synthetic estrogen that exists on the planet. 
and it's in your meat and it gets in your cells and it can absolutely contribute to breast cancer. So we talked about that meat. Let's talk now about seafood and take a question from Helen. She writes, I was told that eating fatty fish can reduce the risk of breast cancer, but I'm wondering if I can get the same benefit from omega-3s that are found in plant foods. Helen, I don't know what person or study told you that eating fatty fish would decrease breast cancer risk. Um, maybe relative to choosing beef steak instead of the fish or something like relative to eating beef, you might, but here's the thing. Saturated fat is never good. Fish as a protein source, animal protein source automatically without, it doesn't matter if it had like the whole ocean to itself and was like a happy swimming fish till it was caught. It literally will create the response of elevating estrogen, of elevating IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor, which is the big growth promoter for all cancers in our bodies. It will increase inflammation. It'll increase angiogenesis, the blood flow that cancers require. It'll impair the immune system. I mean, literally, there is no, no reason to be consuming the fish if, thinking that it's protective. It's not going to be protective. Not to mention that it didn't have the ocean to itself. And instead, it... Uh, is filled with with dioxins and microplastics and PCBs and all of that is getting into you as well and those are all carcinogens. Um, oh yeah, healthy omega three. Yeah, you can get them from plant sources for sure. The highest concentration of healthy omega three fatty acids on planet Earth is in flax seeds. So one to two tablespoons of ground flax seeds a day, and that should be all the omega three you need. Let's see if we can get some help from somebody who unfortunately is currently battling breast cancer and going through treatment. Let's take a question here from Rebecca. She wants to know, will a healthier diet improve the effectiveness of the treatment I'm currently receiving? Rebecca, absolutely. It absolutely will. If you eat predominantly plant-based, if not entirely plant-based during your treatments, you will find that you, you the side effects are dramatically minimized. Another really um, powerful suggestion is if part of your treatment right now is involving chemotherapy, is to undergo your chemotherapy in a fasted state. Studies vary um, in terms of what day, you could be as short as two days, like um, in your second 48 hours of fasting, you can drink teas, black coffee, water, broth, um, vegetable broth, and that could be a fast. There's also um, data that has been published from the same company that makes Prolon, they have a, a kit of food that you eat that puts you into a vegan ketosis. So from a cellular perspective, you're fasting. When you're fasting, there's no insulin running around. In fact, the opposite hormone, glucagon, is like, hey, shh, there's no food here. Everybody calm down. Get get ready to like, you know, hunt down that rabbit when it runs by, like, you know, hearkening back to our hunter-gatherer days. Um, your body is supposed to conserve energy when there's no fuel on board. But guess who's not listening? Cancer, because it's by definition escaped the natural check and control systems of the body. So it's doing its own thing. It's like blah, 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 running around and chemo is always looking for things that are moving fast. So in point of fact, when you do your chemo in a fasted state, you will have a higher tumor kill volume because the chemo, oh, there, you're moving. Let me zap you. And you will have less collateral damage because your normal cells are quieter and the chemo cells pass them more readily. So uh, the company El Nutra did a study on exactly that, and many studies actually, but this particular one that was published is in breast cancer patients undergoing chemotherapy during a four-day fast they're, they call it Zentogen is the name of the thing. It's not commercially available, but what is commercially available is Prolon, which is basically the exact same thing. So you could do Prolon, it's a five day box, but you could just do four days and do your chemo on day four, or you could do the two day broth and water and tea fast that I was mentioning. And you will find that you have fewer side effects and a better result in terms of cancer kill volume. Let's talk about, we, Rebecca is going through treatment. Let's talk a little bit more about prevention here. Take a question from Dorothy. She's wondering, are mammograms safe and what are the other options out there? 
Hmm, Dorothy, mammograms, are they safe? Well, no. I mean, if you want just like a one word answer, but you have to look at risk versus benefit. So it turns out if you take 10,000 women and give them a mammogram every single year from ages 40 to 74, you will cause a radiation induced breast cancer in 8.6 of them, but you will find 860 breast cancers. So in other words, mammograms find 100 times the cancer number that they cause. So you're not wrong. Mammograms do have detrimental effects in addition to like the squashing and discomfort. Um, but in the risk benefit ratio of it all, you might find that it's worth the risk to get the screening. There are not alternatives that have, that produce the exact same uh, detection rates as mammography without any side effects. So in other words, MRI is a little superior to mammograms, but it's 45 minutes in a clanging machine with an IV put in you that has gadolinium dye shot into you. So that's not necessarily a good trade out. People love to ask me about ultrasound as a trade out because that is zero side effects. It's a sound wave that has no effect whatsoever. But ultrasound is completely beholden upon the person doing the ultrasound, the tech. So it's very tech dependent. Um, but it, it and it it will all it will almost always miss DCIS ductal carcinoma in situ, which is a stage zero, totally curable, no chemo needed breast cancer. That is really almost exclusively, except for palpable DCIS, which is infrequent, um, found by mammogram. So by not getting a mammogram, you'll miss the opportunity to be diagnosed with our earliest stage, most curable breast cancer. Um, but the discussion can go on and on, but then you might be avoiding the thing called overdiagnosis and overtreatment, whereby we find cancers that really were never going to cause a life-threatening move in your entire lifetime. So knowing that you're not going to live till 250 years old when this cancer would take you down, it'd be better not to have known about it at all, right? So ultimately, I do think that the most lives are saved with current technology being what it is by getting annual mammography beginning at age 40. There is no question about it, Dr. Funk, that we are living in a stressful time. I mean, life could be stressful even before the pandemic hit. And then you throw everything that we've been going through for the past year and a half. It seems like even longer than that. You throw all of that on top of it. And sometimes it's just like unbearable. So Melissa is wondering, can stress cause breast cancer? Mm, Melissa, stress Stress has been told, reported by the American Psychological Association to keep 40% of us adults awake at night. And a lack of sleep, the circadian rhythm being off, has been definitely tied to an elevation in breast cancer. And it's most evidenced in people whose professions keep them up all night on purpose, like um, pilots and nurses and doctors and janitors, they all have elevated breast cancer risk due to the circadian rhythm being disrupted. Stress is a standalone. What happens when we're super stressed out, whether it's deadlines or work or marital strife, your body kind of gets into this fight or flight phenomenon, which is super fantastic if you literally are about to get eaten by a bear and need to run. But a lot of us live our entire lives as if there's a bear right there about to eat us down, eat us, chomp, chomp, chomp on us. What am I trying to say? <laughs> eat you. And uh, so what happens is when all of these daily life stressors keep you in that fight or flight syndrome, you get physiologic stress that wreaks havoc on your body. And it sets off a chain reaction with all these chemical messengers running around, which uh, can end up elevating estrogen, cancer fuel, and cortisol and dopamine, and then all these inflammatory cytokine things like interleukins and tumor necrosis factor. And these stressful life, life events, chronic stress has been definitely shown in the literature to elevate a lot of cardiovascular disease and death and depression, obesity, um, diabetes, oh. Alzheimer's, GI disease. There hasn't been a study to show stress as a standalone um, cause of breast cancer, the way it has caused the diseases I just mentioned. But I started off by giving you that whole cascade of what happens because obviously breast cancer, one of its requirements to form and flourish is that the chronicity of the inflammation in our bodies and stress definitely contributes. So to the extent that you can meditate or pray or do some gentle stretching and yoga or 
exercise daily to mitigate that stress that your body and your cells are carrying around, then you will, in my opinion, be reducing breast cancer risk. So there's something to the whole idea about eat, and then we'll use eat well, pray, love, right? So that that really seems to be a pretty healthy formula there. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's just the balance, right? Balance of of the men, mind, body, spirit. No doubt. We've got time for two more questions here, Dr. Funk. Hang in there. We're almost through. Let's take a question from Maria. And I think that this is something that you and I can go in depth more so about later on. But Maria is basically wondering, do I get more bang from a buck by slicing up a tomato and putting it on a sandwich or eating that marinara sauce with her pasta? Marinara. So tomatoes are one of the vegetables that have more bioavailability of the magic inside of them, specifically lycopene. It's 300% more bioavailable by eating it cooked for like 15 minutes sauteed. Um, the opposite would be true of cruciferous vegetables, broccoli, uh, which are best consumed raw or lightly steamed, and the whole onion family, onions, leeks, shallots, um, they are better consumed raw. Why? Because heat destroys the enzymes in those two vegetable families, cruciferous and allium, uh, the enzymes that convert the phytochemicals into their magical behavior. So one of my favorite workarounds though, and when you stumble across a vegetable that you find out is better for you raw, but you love it cooked, like roasted broccoli is your favorite thing. Just go, once you cook, however you're gonna cook it, chop up some of the raw bits and throw them back in. You're basically just adding back that enzyme that got heated out and now the enzyme's there. So you're making full use of the conversion potential from the cooked and the raw vegetable. Ooh, that is some cooking science right there. Cooking science at its finest. Yeah, um, it. And let's stick with the kitchen to take us home and take a question from Patricia. You mentioned olive oil a little bit earlier, but she's hoping you can really wrap this one up. She says, does olive oil help to protect against breast cancer? I am on the fence about it because it is high in fat. Okay, Patricia, stay, get, come off the fence. Come here, come here. So <laughs> here's what happens. It's, it's a fat yeah, for sure. And it's touted as healthy because it does have with some of the highest omega-3 fatty acid contents of all oils. That, and believe it or not, organic uh, ex, uh, expressed, uh, what's the word, cold? Ex expel, cold expel pressed? Expressed canola oil. Oh, there we go. Believe it or not, canola, you'd think it's like a crappy oil. It actually has the highest content of omega-3s alongside the extra virgin olive oil. However, the oil is oh so divorced from like that mighty olive that it used to be, that you're really just pulling out pure 120 calories of fat per tablespoon, no matter how, where the source of that oil came from, that's what it is. It's pure fat with a mix of good and bad fat in it. So if you look at studies like the med diet study um, and cancer risk, you really find out that it may not be the oil. It might be not because of the oil, but in spite of the oil, because the rest of the diet was so predominantly healthy and plant-based. I would say, um, if I would say to avoid the oil, because it's just going to contribute to inflammation and fat. There you go. Avoid the oil. But one thing that you probably don't want to avoid is the uh, cancer kicking summit that is coming up here in short order. Dr. Funk, tell us about that. Yes. So my Cancer Kicking Summit is a deep dive into all of the areas of your life you, from a scientific perspective that um, lead to your most healthiest and most joyful existence on the planet. I use all of my 25 years of medicine and studying science and distill it down into two days of extremely fun, energetic, entertaining, but actionable tips on how to live your healthiest life. So join me live at the gorgeous oceanfront resort, Terranea in Southern California, October 16, 17. You can get a discount, 10% off using LBBC, standing for Let's Beat Breast Cancer, LBBC 10. And if you can't make it, but really, really wish you could, you can watch the virtual Online now, LBBC20 gets you 20% off of the virtual Cancer Kicking Summit. I would love to see all of you there.
Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at that resort uh, where it's being held. Uh, that place is absolutely gorgeous looking. Look at that right on the uh, ocean side. My goodness gracious. It's spectacular. It's going to do half my job for me. Everyone's going to feel all like relaxed and healthy yeah. just by walking in. <laughs> hey, man, whatever, whatever makes it easier for you. Um, and of course, it'd be remiss if we didn't mention also uh, your phenomenal book, Breasts, the Owner's Manual. So um, that is an absolute must read. And then let's beat breastcancer.org. Take that pledge, sign up with us, make the commitment to those four steps that we we're going to be talking about all month long to significantly lower your risk of breast cancer. And Dr. Funk, um, the first thing you spoke about in our conversation earlier this week was about just how many of these cases could be prevented. So just again, to hammer home this point in your estimation, what percentage of breast cancer cases could be prevented if if everyone took that pledge and followed those four steps? Chuck, a full 80 to 90 percent of all invasive breast cancer on earth could be mitigated by following the challenge of the Let's Beat Breast Cancer campaign. And specifically, I mean by following a whole food plant-based diet, exercising regularly, minimizing or eliminating alcohol, and maintaining an ideal body weight. Those four factors contribute so mightily to the cause or the reduction of breast cancer in our lives that they alone can control your destiny. And I really invite everybody to join the Let's Beat Breast Cancer campaign at letsbeatbreastcancer.org by taking the challenge to maximally incorporate these lifestyle strategies into your daily existence because you not only will help push breast cancer far away from you, you will be pushing away all of our killers, heart disease, stroke, Alzheimer's, diabetes, obesity, and all of the things that steal you of loving life as much as you should, chronic pain, joint pain, fatigue, autoimmune disorders, thyroid dysfunction, irritable bowel syndrome. These all have their root in the choices that we make every day at the end of the fork and uh, at the end of the day. Are you sitting down? Are you going for a little walk around the neighborhood? All of these choices create cellular changes and those cellular changes then are either working for you or against you every day. I love that so much. I absolutely adore that. And let's not forget also that when you sign up at letsbeatbreastcancer.org, take that challenge. You're also going to get this free e-cookbook, which includes the recipe to your ultimate cancer kicking smoothie, which I'm sure we're going to talk about a little bit later on this month as well. I mean, that thing is just packed full of everything you need to reduce your risk of breast cancer. It is a nutrient bomb, and it's easy to make. You make it yourself in your kitchen every morning. Giddy up. Giddy up. So go sign up right now. Take that challenge, and uh, you will not regret it. Dr. Christy Font, thank you so very much for being here today. I do appreciate it. I appreciate you. Thank you for having me. And to the crew behind the scenes that helps to make the magic happen, thank you guys. And to you, my exam roomies, thank you so very much for tuning in. We're going to do this again real, real soon. But until then, keep it plant-based.